Anyone who's even glanced at video games over this past decade has most likely played or at least heard of a From Software game. Beat Demon Souls, Dark Souls, Dark Souls 2, Bloodborne, Dark Souls 3, or their most recent title, 2019 Sekiro. And to many, it would seem like this relatively unknown team came out of nowhere to give us something we didn't know we wanted until it started killing us over, and over, and over, and over, and over and over again. But the truth is that From Software are far from a new company, their roots beginning on PS1 in 1994 with Kingsfield and have been steadily making games since. Here's the thing though, because of their relative obscurity a lot of FromSoft games saw limited releases outside of Japan. This makes some of the rarer games more sought after among collectors which in turn has sent the second hand resale prices skyrocketing. The Armoured Core series being the least rare can go from a couple of quid onwards but something like Echo Knight or Metal Wolf Chaos can go for around 150 quid. But one of the worst cases is this game which I'll get to in a sec but for now let me just say that the scariest thing about this horror game game is its starting price on eBay. And I'll tell you right now, Kuon's a good game, maybe even a great game, but unless the seller offers to pay your water bill for the year, no game is worth 350 quid. So if you want to play this, and spoiler alert, I'm going to highly recommend you do, you're best doing it on an emulator. <laughs> Onto the game itself. I had a really hard time trying to write about this one. It's an easy enough game to play, but there's just so much going on in terms of both mechanics and plot that I'm just not sure where to begin, because if I go into the mechanics first, it'll be a good 10 minutes till I even get anywhere near talking about the plot. And in terms of the plot and story progression, well, let's just say this story isn't going to end up anywhere near where you think it might. And to be honest, I don't really want to spoil this for anyone that might be even slightly interested in checking it out. So what I think I'll do is a run through here as spoiler free as possible, then maybe do an in-depth look in another video, because there's a lot to go into, not just with the story but the lore and mythology behind it all. On a surface level it's easy enough to sum up your typical Resident Evil slash Silent Hill survival horror, but instead of being set in the American Midwest, it's set in Heian era Japan, which the computer box says is between the years 794 and 1185. From Resident Evil you've got your spooky mansion, multiple campaigns and delicious voice acting. Do you really think father is here? In this place? And from Silent Hill you've got a missing family member, a subplot involving rituals and sacrifices possibly involving said family member, and the oppressive atmosphere of tension and creeping dread weighing down on the whole thing. For instance, this is the first horror game where I've been creeped out as soon as the title screen. Creepy children singing? Check. Haunting imagery? Check. And then out of nowhere it blinks. Totally not creepy at all. What I would advise before getting started is to go into the options to do a couple of things. First, change the voices to Japanese. This isn't even for authenticity, you heard the English dub. Where is Kuriha? And second, we need to go over the controls. Type A is 3D movement and Type B is tank controls, and if you're anything like me, you'll pick Type B thanks to decades of conditioning from Konami and Capcom. Tank controls, for those that don't know, is when pushing up always moves you forward relative to the direction you're facing. Left and right turns you and down makes you step back, and this is generally seen as beneficial to games with fixed camera angles to stop you from getting directionally confused. Don't do this here though, because they're cocked it up. Pressing left or right doesn't turn you on the spot and instead makes you circle around, so if there's something at your feet but slightly off to the side, you'll end up pacing in circles around it trying to pick it up. Now that that's settled, we can actually go on to playing it. So you start by choosing which campaign or phase to play. There's the Yin phase where you play as Utsuki, a priest's daughter who's gone to look for her father, or the Yang phase where you play as Sakia, an exorcist who's gone to investigate the supernatural occurrences. The way this works is kind of like Resident Evil 2, or more specifically the RE2 remake, as in while each phase tells the same overall story from a different perspective, some events, cutscenes and bosses are fought by both characters, despite them seemingly being one of occurrences, and some cutscenes and interactions between the two characters are completely different from each other's perspective. It doesn't really matter which one you play as first, as both are isolated runs, but for the purposes of staying spoiler free, we're just going to look at the in phase here. 
The game opens with a message from your father, a priest called Domen, who has been called away to investigate strange supernatural occurrences in a mansion. He doesn't seem to believe it and thinks it might just be a rat, because, you know, rats and ghosts, easy to get mixed up. He asks that while he's away, you, Utsuki, look after the shrine and watch over your sister, Kuriha, who's in ill health. So obviously the first thing you do is grab your sister and head straight to the manor yourself. From here on in, you'll be investigating a mansion and its surrounding areas, fighting enemies, solving puzzles and collecting items to unlock doors to new areas. Again, I know I already made the Resident Evil comparison, but it really stands out when you summarise it like that. Luckily, any closer inspection takes away any and all notion of this being a rip-off. Once through the entrance, Kuriha wanders off on her own like a toddler in a supermarket and you get separated by Tempest's and tutorial messages. <laughs> Tempests are the game's first unique mechanic and are described as being a mass of harmful malevolent negative energy, though I think this is partly shorthand for jump scares, or attempts at them at least, since the screen flashes negative for a second accompanied by a sharp percussive sting. <laughs> and while not being dangerous on their own as such, running during a Tempest event will give you what the game calls vertigo. A sort of pre-death state signified by blurry vision and increased heart rate that leaves you vulnerable to being killed and also takes away your ability to use magic, and can also be incurred by taking too much damage from enemies. The tutorial messages will also advise you to walk to avoid detection, but this is the game messing with you. You'll get spotted and attacked by every enemy you come across no matter what. So for most of the game you'll be treading lightly, only really using the run button during boss fights or if you get cornered. If and when you do get injured or go into a vertigo state, there are two ways you can heal, either by using one of two types of healing items, or the method you'll use most which is meditating, which is done by holding down a shoulder button for as long as it takes to reach full health again, at which point you'll automatically stop. This doesn't cost anything to do and you can meditate anywhere you like. So if you have a way to fully heal yourself at any point, why bother with the disposable items? The answer is because meditating makes you stand completely still and open to attack, which instantly breaks the meditation itself, so if things are getting hairy mid-fight, you'll need those items. A short ways in and you'll find yourself in a clearing with this little arrangement on the edge of the water. These are your save points, and to save you'll need to perform what's called a cleansing ritual which requires a disposable item called a vessel to do, a la Rezzy's ink ribbons, only you find these all over the place so you'll never need to worry about running out. Watching it sail off's a nice touch though. You have your first fight with the base enemy, a Gaki, and normally I'd go into the combat, but you literally just stand there mashing square until it dies or pretends to. Gakis are generally the easiest enemy to deal with, they rarely swipe at you and if they grab you, you can just shake them off and not lose any health. And they do the Resident Evil thing of not being truly dead until you see the pool of blood form under them, but you can attack while they're down to do a finishing blow to be safe. There are other enemies such as possessed residents, ghosts and these blob things, but they all follow the same method for being dealt with. There's also magic which acts as your ranged attack that comes in the form of disposable cards that act as ammo for each spell. The only other mechanic left to go over is the locked doors. With this being ancient Japan, don't expect to see Resi or Silent Hill style keys like sword or heart or doghouse. Instead, you have bloodstained cloths, and instead of doors being locked with specific keys, they're now closed off with seals. See, each cloth has a certain number of blood stains that can open doors with the same number of seals, i.e. a cloth with two stains can open doors with two seals on, etc. Don't worry though, you're not expected to count blood stains or seals. Instead, the game names each cloth and door after the planet. For instance, Mercury doors and cloths have one stain or seal, Earth has three, and so on. <laughs>
and mechanically, that's about all there is to it. It doesn't stray massively from what's come before, but the ways in which it does try to innovate are quite interesting and overall indicative of From Software's general strife for originality. One thing I will reveal that is a secret, but isn't really a spoiler because they mention it in the manual, is the post-game collectible you can obtain by fulfilling certain criteria. In Resident Evil and Silent Hill, this would normally be a new weapon, such as a rocket launcher or chainsaw, but here, it's backgammon. Yep, you heard me right, Backgammon, which officially makes this the first horror game I'd ever consider recommending to my own mother. Sugoroku, as it's called here, can be unlocked by finding the board in one phase and the pieces in another, and can be played against the AI or a friend, which means this almost completely single player game has a bonus secret game that can be played with two people. Again, only FromSoft could come up with something like this. Now regarding the story, as previously stated there's too much to go over here, a story of two sisters and their missing father, of these twins, of an estate afflicted by an unknown disease, curses and experiments and rituals, and underneath it all, a mystery involving mulberry trees and silkworms. In the meantime, until the next video comes out covering the story, I just want to say I really can't recommend this game enough. It's not the longest in the world, each phase can be comfortably completed in one sitting running at around a couple of hours each, but for anyone looking to get that old school survival horror Richie Tasty scratched, don't let this one pass you by. The price for a physical copy I still don't think is worth it, but again, for those happy to emulate it, it's definitely one for the collection. Where is Korea?